advocated instead. What they advocated instead was the attempt by each of us to structure life in a way that embodies what is distinctive about us as an individual. That's the big deal, and that's why we're we're even talking about all this in in this particular way. Is you've got people who are basically trying to make man's thoughts as an individual be what is dominant. What's the problem with this ad you're looking at? It's oh, not the same difference. Oh. Would you say that wants and needs are the same? No way. That's the reason America's in no. the but if they can kind of convey that idea that, hey, you want this, you need this, when the reality of it is nobody needs a 3, what is it, a 320 or 350Z? That's a 370Z. Yeah, it's 370. Here's the problem, guys. If you are doing this, you're building, people are building their, their house on a false concept of what is truth. There is no such thing as truth, and therefore, yeah, they have no foundations. Psalm 11, verse 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? How do we get here? <laughs> is, that, is that our presence? Let's take a little, little, quick little trip, okay? If we go all the way back to what we'll say begin around A.D. 1700, we had a God-centered absolute truth. It was the pre-modern period. Basically, everybody living during that time, and I'm, you know, obviously I'm generalizing somewhat, but everybody living at that time believed that truth came from God and that we were to conform to God. So you've got a, a pre-modern period where everything is centered around who? God. God. We move a little closer in time to the modern period. That would be the 1700s to the 1960s. This is allegedly the period of enlightenment. This is when basically the world said, hey, you know what? God is nice, but, but man, we're, we're smart. We found antibiotics. We found vaccines. And so all of a sudden, there was a shift between science versus God. There was a, uh, a basic principle that human reason was truth. Religious beliefs were then sent to the background. So if you think of this on a pendulum, you've got a pendulum where in the pre-modern period, everything centered around God. In the modern period, all of a sudden people said, hey, we're smart. We can, we've got answers. We can basically do whatever we want to do. And that shifted away from God and towards man. We go to the post-modern period. 1960 to present, where you have a rejection of modern period. Why would we reject it? Because science can't answer the, the important questions. Okay. Guys, if you think about it this way, in all seriousness, and this, is, this has been shown to be legit, you've got a hippie generation that grew up basically wanting peace, wanting this carefree sex, wanting all these kinds of what we would call the hippie movement. 1960s and 1970s, they woke up and they realized that their parents, even though their parents were living in the modern period and said they had the answers, deep down their parents didn't. They, there was no peace. They didn't provide peace to them like they said they was going to do. The sex thing turned into a, a major nuclear bomb because all of a sudden you got sexually transmitted diseases. And so what you had was a mass rejection of anything that was considered to be the establishment, whether it be your parents, whether it be the government. So you've got a postmodern period where they are rejecting this modern period. 
they say not only is man not truth, there are no universal truths. They reject the system traditions of, of those previous to them, and basically instead of using any kind of reason, we're now living in a period where people use their feelings. So we've gone from pre-modern period where truth was God to a post-modern period where people are, instead of conforming to God, they're basically going off whatever their feelings tell them to do. And if you look around, think about <clears throat> what some of these graphic tees say today. It's all about me. Or, you know, what makes me feel good. There's actually t-shirts that are so self-absorbed, self-centered, it just it floors me when I see them. But the point is, they're describing this postmodern period. How would you say Christianity has fallen during the same time? What, what have we seen in Christianity during these, these three times? That idea of worship, it's all about me. So you would say that, that this concept of truth has also affected the church. Of course. Absolutely. So in the 1700s, you got people who realized that everything is still about God. And as such, they don't build these massive church buildings to please themselves. They go and they worship God. In the modern period, <coughs> it was kind of the, okay, let's build this building and they'll come to us. And more and more people during the modern period started leaving the church because they felt like the church didn't have the answers. In fact, they started putting their allegiance into science. Post-modern period, you got a whole bunch of people that basically are saying, okay, man can't provide everything. God's got to, you know, there's got to be something else, but I want to use my feelings, my emotions. And so... Church, they see it as basically a way for them to exhibit any kind of emotional uh, worship or relationship when the reality of it is that's not what we're called to be. Do I believe that religion should have some kind of an emotional thing to it? Absolutely. We've got to have a relationship with God. But do I think our, our religion should be based simply on feelings? No. Absolutely not. Other thoughts, comments, questions on this? Would you say that we are still in a postmodern period? Or do you think we've moved even beyond that? Beyond that? I think Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah I, I, when I teach people, like in a public setting, I'll oftentimes say, I think we're into a, uh, an excessive individualism stage. And by that I mean we have left postmodernism, and now it is all about self. See, it is so all would, about. Would you call it individualism? Excessive individualism. Okay, so here's how all of this plays into what we're discussing. Multiculturalism advocates a society that extends equitable status to distinct cultural and religious groups with no one culture predominating. Does that sound familiar today by chance? Yeah. In other words, do our kids in government schools come up through school with this idea that all religions are basically the same and that no religion is better than the other. Guys, that's multiculturalism. How about this one? Pluralism. What is pluralism? We can both be right. In many different ways. Oh, yeah. We're all right. You got your way. I got my way. It's all good. What's the problem with that? Guys, that's Oprah Winfrey religion in a way. 
multiple ways. Any of you watch this particular movie, Pleasantville? Yes. Tell me what is, I put a picture down there at the bottom that's in black and white, and yet the lady's face you'll notice is in color. What's the big deal about black and white versus color in this town? The people in black and white were just satisfied with the status quo. Um, they, they weren't after any kind of change. Okay, keep going. You're right, but basically it was one of those deals where, if you remember, it was kind of like the people who, once they had come to a knowledge of, quote, the truth, that things could be bigger and better and more wonderful, that's when their little world turned color. And so it was like everybody who's in black and white was walking around in this zombie land, Whereas once you got knowledge of the truth and realize, hey, things can be bigger, better, and brighter, then suddenly it's not black and white. Um, interesting little movies, given what we're talking about. Here is what I see happening with you guys and with people today. Tell me if this doesn't sound correct. We got a, we'll call this young lady, we'll say she's 12, even though she's probably more like about nine. She has got several different communities that she belongs to. For instance, she belongs to her family, which we're going to say is the red community. She belongs to her school, which is the yellow circle. She belongs to her church community, which is the green circle. And she belongs to her sporting and extracurricular activities in Girl Scouts, which we're going to say is the Blue Circle. Now, you got family, you got school, you got church, and you got outside activities. Here's my question, guys. What happens when those different communities define truth differently? Which ultimately they're going to do. Confusion. You got all kinds of confusion. And that's when you look at this young lady, you realize she doesn't know which way is right, which way is up or down, because you've got mom and dad saying one thing, you got school saying something else, you got church saying something else, and you got her friends and extracurricular activities saying something else. We got to get back to a situation where there's a single deal. How many of you in there have seen the bumper stickers that say coexist, like what's on the screen? I have a lady at the apartment complex with that name. I don't want a car yesterday. Okay, so you guys have seen that? Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, let me bring to mind what this actually means in reference to absolute truth. The C is actually a symbol for Islam. The star would be for peace. The E M C squared is male and female. The star of David Judaism. The uh, you've got a Wicca for the I, or the pagan Baha belief. You've got Confucianism, Taoism, and then Christianity. What's the problem? It can't coexist. There's only one right way. They don't agree with each other. That's right. They, they think that they are being so cool, wise, and, and you know, it's kind of like I've risen to this Zen state. I'm telling everybody we should coexist. When the reality of it is, if you look at all that stuff up on the screen, there's no way you can coexist. Because the essence of what those things teach is not coexistable. I mean, the very fact that you've got Muslims, you've got Taoists, You've got Baha'i faith, and you've got Christians in the same lump. And yet Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And Islam's want to kill Christians. And Islam's basically say anybody that doesn't worship Muhammad is an infidel. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those situations where... Just because you see this nice little sticker and you think, oh, that's cool, yeah, you know, that's hip. But the hiddenness of it is really garbage because 
The reality of it is there is a truth. There's an absolute truth. We can know truth, and yet people will not admit it because it, it's very confrontational and it goes against their grain. And also, if you admit that there's an absolute truth, then all of a sudden that person may actually have to obey the truth. Somebody tell me what's the difference between objective versus subjective truth. Let me back up. Object. What is objective truth? It's um, something by a standard, maybe? By a view? Um, there's one standard that you put everything up against. <clears throat> okay. You got a single standard where you measure everything else against. What about subjective? It, it's depending on the situation. So it's more like a almost like situation ethics. Yeah. It's subjective according to how you you know basically what you think, how you feel, that kind of thing. Um, this is a song some of you may recognize the uh, the lyrics. Somebody tell me who the author of this song is. I hitched a ride with a vending machine repairman. He says he's been down this road more than twice. He was high on intellectualism. I've never been there, but the brochure looks nice. Jump in, let's go. Lay back, enjoy the show. Everybody gets high, everybody gets low. These are the days when anything goes. I don't know. Anybody know who sings that? Yeah, it's a lady. Yes, it is a lady. It's a... Uh... Carrie Underwood. No, it's uh, Shania Twain. Nope. She dated Lance Armstrong. Cheryl Crow. There Crow. you go. Yep. Very nice. She says, these are the days when anything goes. And yet, Judges chapter 21, verse 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone who did what was right in his own eyes. Same basic principle, guys. These are the days when anything goes. You know, do whatever's right in your own eyes. What was subjective? How is how is Satan able to do this? A couple of ways. Number one, he causes people to question things. Number two, he basically causes folks to to contradict the truth. Number three. He gives you alternatives. You know, not this, but this. When you look at that, you know, that's how he operates. You realize that there are a lot of people out there who have fallen prey because either the religion that they are currently in or their belief system, they have questioned what is truth, and they have bought into alternatives that Satan has offered up. Let's, I'm going to peg off the thing for just a minute. I know you guys have got snow, and I'm going to let you guys out a little bit early. But I do at least want to talk about um, racism and prejudice for just a minute. At least introduce a topic, and then maybe we can finish up on Thursday. I see y'all smiling. <laughs> yeah, he's letting us out! Snow day! <laughs> Yeah, I like a bunch of little kids. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. I wasn't going to say the situation. Wayne, Wayne, you, you are. Anyway. I'm going to give you tomorrow. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Tell me, tell me why. Racism exists today. Ignorance. Okay, ignorance is a great answer. Uh, fear. Fear? Yeah. Okay. The way you were raised, I guess, maybe? Okay. Think outside of just the United States, guys. Sometimes we, we just center on our own little box. When we take a look historically at mankind, what has been the tendency for people? What, what do we normally do? 
Stick with our own kind, I guess. Okay, we stick with our own kind. Now, let's, let's take that a step further. When you look at topics like prejudice and slavery and the ethics of it, why do you think people justified something like slavery? You mean in the, in the United States? Anywhere, yeah. They, they looked at themselves as superior to that other race. For and now we're finally cooking with gas, yes. So you got a situation where, for whatever reason, one culture believes that they are superior to a different culture. Now, why do you think that, that takes place? Have you ever read an article about Willie Lynch? Willie Lynch, what's... Basically, he has slave, <clears throat> black slaves. He's a white man. He teaches people how to train slaves. So basically, and he speaks in code, keeps the blacks uneducated. Uh, and they do this in other countries as well. Keep them uneducated so that they can rule and just keep them idiotic. And basically, they learn. And it's like a caste system, pretty much. Right. Like in India or something like that. <clears throat> okay, ethically speaking, what do we know about mankind, about humans? Selfish, prideful, prideful man. Okay, back to, but as far as God, if, if I were teaching a class on, this is a book called, this is called One Blood. Okay, if I were teaching a class on mankind and I'm trying to go into a congregation and get rid of some of the stereotypes, get rid of some of the prejudice, get rid of some of the racism. What's the first thing I have to establish? We're made in the image of God. All men are created equal. All men are made in the image and likeness of God. All men are created equal. What do you think is going to be one of the first walls that you got to knock down? Color. Okay, why? Because and you're right. Because we look different, obviously. It separates. Because it's so We look in our different, culture. but okay, Dustin. Here's the thing. I agree and I disagree. Okay. Do you have any children? I have a daughter. Yes. How old? Eighteen months. Okay. Do you realize your daughter is still colorblind? And by that I mean she she to this day. And probably for the next two to three years of her life, will not recognize a difference in color amongst human beings. When she goes to a playground to play, she does not notice a difference in color. What she notices is a little boy or a little girl who may be their playmate. Right. It's only when we get a little bit older that we start going, oh, wait a second, that person not like me. <clears throat> So we gotta okay, we gotta deal with the color issue. What are some other prejudices? Uh, economical prejudice. Yeah, economic status. Socioeconomic, guys. I would say in the church that is one of your biggest. Because even though we say in the church that we want to evangelize the world, you know what the reality of it is? In most congregations where I go, we want to evangelize middle to upper class clean people who've all showered. Yep. We don't want somebody coming in off the street who doesn't look like us or smell like us because that makes us uncomfortable. When the reality of it is, if that person, if we really believe they have a soul, they've got a soul. What else? What are some other prejudicial things? Um, education uh, is one. In intelligence, absolutely. Uh, maybe even uh, whether you're homeschooled or not, you know. Uh, if we're talking about the church, there could be a lot of things. Whether or not you're skilled at being social, maybe. When you, when we say social, do, does that involve uh, intellectual as well? Okay, let's, let's take these one at a time. So you are a preacher. You go into a place, you realize that there is not a, a family atmosphere you realize that you've got 
some dark-skinned people that sit to the right, some light-skinned people that sit to the left. They do not mix at all. They do not do things together. First thing you do is you try to preach and teach and communicate to, in order to get those people together. Let's say that you've been there for six months, and Chuck, I'm going to let you take this one. One of them comes up to you and says, my daughter wants to marry that white guy. <laughs> That's why I said Chuck and not Quentin. <laughs> Go ahead, Chuck. What do you What do you say? Well, since they're bringing it to me, I would ask them how they feel about it. Um, if they think anything's wrong with it. <laughs> time out! Time out! Wait! 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 We just spent an hour talking about we don't need to know what somebody else, like, express yourself and how do you feel. Oh, that garbage out the window. What is the absolute truth about it? The absolute truth is that it doesn't matter. I don't care. But, okay. But if they're coming to me about it, then obviously they have some issue in their heart or in their mind that needs to be straightened out. And so right. that's why I would ask them. Okay. Because I don't want there to be a problem in the relationship because of what the father thinks to be the absolute truth or or just what he thinks to be a problem, basically. Okay. Fair game. Fair game. Who wants to add to that? Do you think you will have people come to you with those questions? The answer is absolutely they will, guys. Um, Unfortunately. And I'm, I'm not singling... Chuck out at all one way or the other. Um, I think he knows me enough, knows where I stand and how I shoot. But the fact of the matter is there are going to be some of the guys in there who are lighter skinned who have light skinned people come to them and say, my sibling, my child wants to marry a black person. Talk them out of that. How do you respond to that? Can't do it. Okay. I mean, if they're if they're eligible for marriage and a good couple get together, then I mean, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. That's what I would tell See, them. See, it I, here, here's where I think we've screwed up in the church. Go ahead, Dustin. I also think the the color difference is obviously not an issue, but they also need to understand that there could be an issue with public. They could have problems in the future, and they, they need to understand that before they step into that. But, you know, I don't, I don't buy my, that that much. Just, like, just saying, if my daughter wanted to marry uh, somebody different than she was, I wouldn't care. That would be great. If he was a Christian man, awesome. But I'll... Here, here, here's, here's the question that you've got to come back to them with. If you know that individual will get your child to heaven, does it matter? Nope. Does it matter their skin color? Because I'll go ahead and tell you, if, if my daughter grows up and she says, Dad, this person over here who's purple is going to help me get to heaven versus I can marry this guy over here who's pink who is basically a Christian, but really is apathetic, and he's just punching a time clock, I want her to be with a purple guy. You bet. I want her to be with somebody who is going to actively get her to heaven. All right, so the first thing we deal with is that. Now, we still got a, a situation where people are divided by socioeconomic issues. How do you address that in a church? What do you What do you do? Take him to what? I said take him to James. He knows what's up. Take him to James, all right? <laughs> James Cooker. I mean. Why Why James? It's a good book on practicality. What is it going to teach him, though? How to be practical. He says that there's no impartiality with God. Okay. How do you also, get people, though, to cross the line, guys?
Well, so how do you get people to cross the line? Oh. You go first. You lead them. You, you can't. It's easier to lead than it is to push. Okay. And here's, here's the, the fact of the matter. Until you can get them to see each other not as, as money figures, but as human beings, then all the efforts you try are, are futile. And so what it's going to take are going to be actual situations where you are in each other's homes, where you are actually doing the work of bringing these people together as human beings. So it may mean that KJ has to have two wealthy people and two pitifully poor people into his house a couple of times to where they can make some kind of a connection. Or it may be that you have to pick up a rich person and say, hey, go visiting with me and go into the home of a poor person. Or vice versa. But you've got to get them to be able to see each other for more than just a financial deal. How do you deal with the educational part? Let's say you got somebody that's a, a educated snob, and you got some people who are great, just good old boy farm boys. Teach on pride. Okay. Number one, you got to teach on pride. What else? Could you have them? Could you have like an activity where they both have their talents? I mean, because each one of them is going to have a certain talent that they can learn from the other. You know, like a like the rich guy, like maybe to ba or be have a money uh, managing class, or you know, class, yeah. and then have a the if the, if the like the less I don't know, whatever you know, a garden. Have a farming or, class. Yeah, well, you know, like a garden <laughs> or a garden or you know. How to be country. Yeah. Somebody tell me what is the background of the writers of the Bible? All over. Very diverse. All over. And as such, we need to basically keep that in our minds and focus other people on it. Because, guys, that book would not be complete if you, you know, if you just say, hey, let's keep the rich guys. Or let's kick out the rich guys. You're not going to have a complete book. It took both the wealthy and the, and the poor people, Dustin. Wasn't that the significance of Jesus coming back as a carpenter? Coming back because they were expecting this great king and not this lowly carpenter? Yeah, I think that's part of it. So, just another example. Sorry. That's part of it. I mean, if you think about it for just a moment, Christ, if he's going to be the son of somebody in that time, chances are 99.9% .9 he is going to be the son of somebody in what we might consider to be a lowly job whether it be a carpenter, a blacksmith, a fisherman, you know, something that is not high-end, high-dollar because there weren't that many high-end, high-dollar people. KJ? I would tell them the only education that matters is education in the Word of God. Okay. There we go. Now we're starting to, now we're starting to bring it back around. So how many people knew stuff back in the Dark Ages or – you know, what did the Catholics used to do with the Bible? They used to chain it to the pulpit so that the average man couldn't see it. Point being, it doesn't take a, an advanced degree to get to heaven. It takes somebody who has a, a desire to serve Christ and can obey the gospel. So um, in, some, in some aspects, I think people who are more educated and have more money probably have more hurdles to overcome to be closer to God. Doesn't mean they can't. Just think they can probably have more hurdles. All right. Any other thoughts, comments? You guys are, are getting off easy today. Well, let's, before I let you go, on, on Thursday, y'all go ahead and spread the word. We're going to be talking about sex, of all things. Uh, ethics of sex, homosexuality, what is right, what is wrong, what should be considered right, what should be considered wrong. Um, between now and then, if you have not started working on your paper, please do so. Because, guys, don't, don't wait until the last minute like some people always do. Um, do not email me the night before and say, now, exactly what were you wanting? Because I will probably be out with my wife enjoying a night on the town and may turn my phone off. 
Um, any other comments, questions? All right. I'm going to let you guys go home and get out of the snow. Pretty deep. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Are y'all really supposed to get a foot? What they say. They